All right, I was going to intro this, but what comes up says it all. All right, uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, this is Build Your Own UAV 2.0, wireless uh, mayhems from the heaven. My name's Michael Wagand. I'm from the United States Military Academy, West Point, and I'm with... Uh, I'm Renderman. I'm just a nice guy, so... You know, I don't have the, the, quite the title he does, but... What, you don't believe me? Hey, so we want to keep the we want to keep the energy up uh, today. So uh, so let's let's show a little intro movie. Um, Render, what time were we up last night? Uh, I think we finally got things going at about uh, just after midnight. After midnight? Yeah. And w where were we? Uh, we were just up the strip at the Hilton Grand Great whatever resorts that was there. Uh, more correctly, the parkade that's right across there, um, about the thirteenth floor of said parkade. Um, yeah, there's no cameras up there, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and so after these guys spending a, a great deal of time uh, and energy trying to get this, the plane up and running, um, some unforeseen technical difficulties got in the way. We had to do our, our proof of concept of something. So um, yeah, basically my iPhone went for a flight. Um, so. As you see by the video, it was a very uh, interesting flight. So, so uh, let's go ahead and roll this tape here. Are we rolling? Oh, I think we're minimized. You're going to need audio on the laptop. Some audio? Oh. oh. And, uh, and this is where it gets a little hairy. Um, I think it's because we were, you know, playing Peep and Tom and uh, the gods were coming after us. So, right about here, we must have pissed somebody off. Stabilizer motion. Stabilizer motion. There's a reason you don't see a plane on the stage right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, my phone went for about a 400 foot free fall inside of the styrofoam plane. So, uh, you know. <laughs> Now we did recover. We'll show you the damage a little later on. But um, all right, let's get back to business real quick. <laughs> I mean, the slide speaks for itself. Also, uh, Render, you have a service announcement to make, right? I do. Yes. Uh, the the Fs, the three Fs. Oh uh, yeah. Anybody who's here from the FAA, FCC, or Apple warranty departments, please identify yourselves. <laughs> if security could escort them. <laughs> Okay. If you are in the crowd, and I know, you must be out there, we are not answering your questions. <laughs> okay, so uh, real quick, uh, let's do a little uh, technology overview. Um, UAVs, we've all heard about them. You know, w what are they? All right, so UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. We know they're pilotless aircraft, right? We've all heard of the Predator drone, you know, uh, in, in combat, war zones and everything. But, uh, but what makes a UAV a UAV versus an autonomous UAV, you know? Etc. So autonomous, we all know autonomous means it's a self-governing vehicle. It, it has no pilot, no human interaction whatsoever. Unmanned aerial vehicle doesn't necessarily mean that a plane's autonomous. It just means that there's not you know, a human being up there. So no pilot necessary per se in the airframe. Um, predator drones, for example, can be remotely piloted or they can be set you know, to, uh, to basically run an autopilot, much like, and I guess this is kind of scary, any plane that you flew on to get over here. Chances are your pilot just took off, hit that red button and put his feet up on the dash and uh, you know Hopefully started that back the on the off switch. Yeah. Got to got to watch that red button there. But um but yeah, so most vehicles, most uh, planes these days are capable of, you know, autopilot features. But what makes a unmanned aerial vehicle autonomous is that it doesn't require any human interaction for the entire duration of of the uh, flight. It has higher level intelligence. 
Um, it can uh, predict uh, weather patterns, you know, alter its uh, flight plan according to you know, numerous criteria. It can make decisions like a human being can. An autopilot, as you can imagine, simply just flies a pre-programmed route. Um, now these, uh, these UAV systems, they, uh, they range from you know, medium to large scale uh, systems and what we're going to show you today are basically what you can do if uh, you, know, you have $1,500, $2,000, you want to go out, spend some time, you know, experience some heartbreak like we did last night and, uh, and build your own system. Yeah, so, it was more uh, the abject terror when we were seeing, you know, blinking police car lights in the yeah. distance. So. The plane hits the ground and, like, sure enough, whoop, whoop, and they're right oh, down crap. the street. We're like, should we go get this? Or, <laughs> <laughs> Render, did you wipe your prints? Yeah. Uh, I forgot about that part. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you guys were interested in going out in the market, now, talk on my slides keep breaking. And, uh, and you wanted to build uh, your own system, um, more down at the DIY level, there are a whole series of, of complete autopilot uh, uh, solutions for uh, model airplanes. Um, all the way down at the bottom is the Ardu Pilot project. That's probably the cheapest uh, one that I've come across yet. The original board was $25. Now, um, it's, it's just a microcontroller. It's just an, Ardu, uh, an Arduino that's been modified for uh, UAV purposes. And um, honestly, that's, that's more than enough. To, uh, to get a plane to, to fly autonomously, um, or pseudo-autonomously. You still have to take off and land. But you give control over to it, and it, it flies basically whatever you program in. Now, they've since graduated to um, an Arduino Mega that they've modified uh, for purposes, and um, you know, I guess kind of not too creatively called their, uh, their new board Ardu Pilot Mega. But um, there's some other boards out there as well. The UAV dev board, the Paparazzi project, that's a, an open source Linux-based uh, autopilot project. Um, FlexiPilot, Easy UAV. Getting more into the more expensive uh, commercial products for small scale models, we have uh, Autopilot. And then you see up in the red, those are systems that cost over $1,500 and frankly are kind of out of my uh, you know, student budget. So. I didn't really focus on those much. But the point is that if you have a little bit of change and uh, you have the, the interest, there's a whole bunch of ready-made solutions out there that you can integrate into airframes. So um, continuing on with our, uh, our UAV uh, tech demo, um, basic flight characteristics. So an unmanned aerial vehicle is a plane, essentially. They can also be helicopters. They can be, you know, uh, I don't know what else there is, but I've, I've seen some crazy stuff. I've even seen a flying lawnmower. Take it for what it's worth, but all UAVs share a couple things in common. Um, they all have to fly, they all have to navigate, and they all operate some type of payload. So flight, we know uh, any type of flying body is uh, affected by you know, four forces up in the air. You've got lift, weight, or gravity, thrust, and drag affecting uh, you know, that, that, uh, that body that's uh, moving through um, air, which essentially is just a fluid. And so uh, when we're flying, we have to both stabilize the platform and we also have to uh, take into account, you know, uh, airspeed um, and, uh, you know, maintain, maintain some semblance of altitude, unlike uh, what we did last night. Yeah. Um, so once we have the flying piece and the, the plane's actually in the air, then we need to somehow control it. We want to give it direction because we want it to go where we want it to go. So that's where the navigation uh, piece comes in handy. And uh, we'll talk uh, in a moment about the different uh, components that, you know, make this really easy um, and, and cheap to perform. And then third, you know, putting a, a UAV up in the air, all right, that's cool. We, we now have this object that can fly around wherever we want it, but what if we want it to do something? Now, I'm sure many of you out there can think of all kinds of creative applications for a plane that can fly by itself, but, you know, we want to operate some type of payload, so maybe we want to do some sensing uh, missions like we were last night, you know, checking out uh, who left their blinds open on the Vegas, Vegas Strip. Or, um, hey, maybe we want to do some sniffing operations. We want to... I don't know, I want to follow Renderman as he, you know, uh, sees all the sites around Vegas and he just happened to leave his iPhone uh, 802.11 on, uh-oh. Um, you know, maybe we want to send some live video back like uh, we were doing, um, using RF. Uh, shoot, maybe we want to put a laser up there. And I'm sure you guys can think of all kinds of other applications. We'll actually talk about some more payloads uh, a little later on. Okay, so stabilization. This is traditionally one of the more difficult aspects of flying in general, but fortunately because of um, 
the, uh, the state of the industry, common off-the-shelf parts, COTS, they have, uh, the price for these components has dramatically dropped. There's essentially two very simple, easy, and inexpensive ways to stabilize any type of model airframe. The first is the thermal pile sensor approach. This essentially is a, a, a two axes um, thermal pile uh, sensor board, which senses the infrared difference uh, between the sky and the ground. I'll show you next uh, slide. They're really easy to use. They're extremely cheap, 40 to 60 bucks. And uh, in almost all weather conditions and terrain environments, they're more than enough. Now, given they don't work so well in blizzards or in very dense fog, in uh, mountainous urban terrain like uh, we are here in Vegas, but you know, for your average uh, application, it's more than enough. And then the other method is the inertial measurement unit. Essentially, you're taking three, um, uh, three accelerometers or gyroscopes, and each one of them is uh, on axes with uh, one of the three planes. And then using uh, some calculations and, and math, we can essentially sense every uh, change to that airframe as it, it moves in three-dimensional space. And so that way we have a, a pretty good idea of uh, its current orientation. Um, these systems are becoming cheap. They're more complex and a little bit difficult to work with, but at the moment there are autopilots that are using um, just, uh, just IMUs that are relatively inexpensive, and we can continue to see this drop in the next couple months specifically. So the thermal pile based approach. This is my favorite because, again, it's the cheapest. Hey, anything that's cheap is good with me. And also, uh, for me, it, so far it's been the most fail safe. We Except for when that, you don't have hot glue. That's When it falls off the airframe and it's dangling in the slipstream, it doesn't work so well. <laughs> Go figure. But um, usually, you know, we just put this little black box. Uh, this is an FMA Copilot 4 sensor. Uh, it's, I think, 60 bucks or 70 bucks from FMA Direct. And we just, we were supposed to hot glue this to the top. But um, we didn't have any hot glue and we got a little excited, so we figured double-sided sticky tape from CVS would be enough. <laughs> so it falls off and, you know, it, it's seeing the horizon do this and everything, and the autopilot's doing exactly what it was supposed to and trying to keep it level. Unfortunately, when the horizon's doing this, that's kind of hard, and gravity is a harsh mistress. But. I submit that it was actually keeping it level to what it was sensing, but... <laughs> Just so you know, all, all know, we tested it. Gravity still works. It's still good. Yeah. And the iPhone survives. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you, can, you guys can kind of see one sensor will face uh, the ground when the wings are tilted left, right, or forward, backward. And um, the other sensor will see more of the sky. The sky in the infrared spectrum is always colder than the ground, even when it's covered with snow and ice like it normally is in uh, northern New York, where I'm holed up most of the year. So uh, we know that in almost all weather conditions, this works pretty nicely. Uh, this gives us a horizon sense, uh, sensing capability. It's very easy to work with uh, writing your own custom code uh, because it gives you a nice little even distribution like you see in the bottom. And we essentially just want to minimize the error between the opposite sensors and two axes. And so we just you know, give out um, control outputs to the elevator, which is going to make it you know, go up and down, nose up and down. or um, to uh, our ailerons or rudder, depending on our airplane configuration, which is going to make it tilt left and right, like you see uh, our fighter jet here. So very simple. Um, servos. So the airplane, the whole uh, servos are relatively simple to, to many, many of you, but I actually found these a little complicated when I got started. Uh, servos have become pretty, uh, pretty advanced in recent years. For 12 or 13 bucks, you can get this HS55. It's an um, extremely small, extremely lightweight um, servo that is able to swing its arm to a very specific direction um, given a uh, PWM or pulse width modulated signal. So on the bottom left you see you know, with a minimum pulse, a neutral pulse, or a maximum pulse it will swing the arm to a given direction. It provides a lot of torque, very fast response time, and uh, they're, they're very reliable. Um, did I mention they're really inexpensive? So uh, as you can see uh, the servo, it's essentially just a motor and it has a potentiometer and a control circuit on there. You just feed it five volts and uh, in the signal, you know, the PWM signal, and it's good to go. The servos are what we uh, use to control all the control surfaces on the plane. The ailerons, the uh, rudder, the elevator. When you're flying home, you know, if you get one of those awesome window seats, I'm a fan of window seats, and you look out to the left and you kind of see, you know, that, uh, that aileron going, you know, left, right, trying to keep the plane um, flat. Well, essentially, I, I love how you say trying. Trying. It probably it is worse than on that seat. You. 